my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Panda Crate from KiwiCo. Encourage natural curiosity in your little one with Panda Crate, a subscription service for brain building play designed for babies and toddlers from zero to 24 months. My best friend's baby has been loving the Panda Crate bead maze. It's the perfect size for little hands and helps her practice fine motor skills. We're excited to have our youngest graduate from the Panda Crate to the monthly themed koala crates for ages two to four, a great gift idea for a big sibling after baby arrives. Panda Crate ships every other month and each crate includes two months worth of play along with helpful resources and inspiration for parents. There's no commitment so you can pause or cancel anytime. Every material, color, angle, and curve is designed to stimulate your baby's brain development through play. Every product is made from non-toxic materials and meets or exceeds safety testing standards. Unlock brain-building play and create a foundation for early learning with Panda Crate from KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month plus free shipping with code BIRTHHOUR at KiwiCo.com. That's 50% off your first month at KiwiCo.com, promo code BIRTHHOUR. At the end of this episode, I talked to Katie from KiwiCo all about the Panda Crate line and how they developed it. So stay tuned for that conversation. I want to remind everyone that if you're a big fan of this podcast, you can get more episodes by becoming a Patreon member. Patreon is a way to support creators that you love at different monthly tier levels. And you can head over to patreon.com slash birth hour to see some of the perks and bonuses that come with being a birth hour Patreon member. One of our biggest things is access to our archived episodes. So if you're not finding enough birth stories in your regular podcast feed, there are hundreds and hundreds more by becoming a Patreon member. And if you aren't already aware of our online childbirth course, it's called Know Your Options. It's evidence-based childbirth education, and you do it all at your own pace online, and you get lifetime access. We cover everything from the final weeks of pregnancy through preparing for birth, postpartum, and feeding your baby. I would go into so much detail here if I could, but there's so much in that course. We outline it all at thebirthhour.com slash course. You can see what's in the different 12 modules, plus the bonus course that you get all about pumping and feeding your baby. And again, all that information is at thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Today's birth story guest is Amelia, and she has three very different birth experiences to share with you, starting as a hospital birth when she was in college, and then a birth center birth, and then ending with a hospital induction. All right, let's hear from Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me, Bren. I'm so excited to be here. All right. So before we get to your stories, can you start by telling us a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, sure. So we are a family of five and we live in Sarasota, Florida. Um, I have a 14-year-old son. I have a five-year-old sassy daughter Mm -hmm. and I have a um, two-year-old son. So two boys and one girl. All right. And we're going to hear all three stories today. So let's start with your first pregnancy and how that went for you. Yeah. So my my first pregnancy was completely unplanned. Um, I was a freshman in college. I'd taken some time off before going to college. So I was a little bit older, but I was 21 when I found out that I was pregnant in my freshman year of college. And being a, a single mom <laughs> was a shock to me um, or the potential of being a single mom. And I feel like the pregnancy was from a, a physical standpoint, very straightforward, but all of the emotions that I was dealing with in regards to having an unplanned pregnancy and the lack of emotional support that I received from family members and friends. And eventually it all worked out, but that kind of carried over into the labor, just not feeling supported from an emotional standpoint. Yeah, that sounds like it would be really, really hard, especially Mm -hmm. dealing with your first year of college and everything. Absolutely. So as far as um, prenatal care, what did you seek out? So I knew that I wanted less medical just from the very beginning. 
I would probably say like my threshold for pain was very low. Like I was that tender headed child who cried when she got her hair brushed. So like everyone thought, you know, oh, she's, you know, gonna want an epidural. She's gonna, but I I knew that I didn't want that. And so I sought out um midwifery care. Um and being that it was my first pregnancy and I was young, like I did some research, but I knew that I wanted it to be in a hospital setting, but with the least amount of intervention possible. So I went the midwife route. And actually the practice that I chose did centering pregnancy. And so all of my prenatals for the most part were in a group setting with other women. That's where I got my emotional support from. My community was in that particular setting. Yeah. I was just about to ask that question. So that's wonderful that you had that. I love that model, um, especially for first time parents. I think it's so wonderful. Absolutely. And for anyone who doesn't know about that, it's where you like have your appointments with a group of people and that way any questions that get asked are kind of answered for everyone. Exactly. All right. So with the midwife model, let's talk a little bit about any kind of planning you did for your birth. Was it just those centering classes or did you do any kind of birth preparation? Yeah, I did do birth preparation. So I kind of just Googled different types of classes and kind of wrote over the different summaries. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled across um, hypnobirthing, um, the Mongan method. And um, I believe a friend of mine had done hypnobabies or something similar to that. But the Mongan method spoke to me because it was in person. Um, And I think hypnobabies at the time was just a self-study course. And I wanted the one-on-one interaction. And so I signed up for the class and I went to, I think it was a series of five classes. And my mother did come to a few of them, but for the most part, it was just myself and doing the work there. So reading the book, listening to the relaxation tracks, and then um, the birthing class. So having all of the information from Centering Pregnancy and in combination with the hypnobirthing class, I really felt like I had all of the information and tools and techniques I needed to have an unmedicated birth, which was my ultimate goal. And were you planning for your your mother to be kind of your birth support person? I think I was. Again, there was still some tension yeah. <laughs> given the situation. Yeah. And so I actually ended up asking my hypnobirthing educator who was also a birth doula as well, um, if she would attend my birth. And so I had kind of that the double support mm-hmm. of having my mother who who knows me intimately, who knows my personality and what different signs mean or, you know, and then a doula who is trained in supporting emotional and physically the laboring process and the early postpartum. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, hear about how labor started for you. So funny enough. So my due date actually got moved a couple of times with my first. Okay. Initially, it was November 10th, and then they moved it to the third. And so my son decided that he was going to come right in the middle. I remember at one of my prenatals, I got a pelvic exam and I was three centimeters. And so I walked around three centimeters dilated for about four or five days. Um, and my job was like, you know what? Why don't you not not come? I think we should just go ahead and start your leave now. I think they were scared I was going to go into labor at work. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, I took a few days off in preparation. And I remember saying to my son, you know, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to come whenever you feel like you want to, we're ready and we're waiting for you. And literally the next night I started to go into labor, but I didn't know I was in labor. There are certain signs that your body can give you to let you know that you are in labor. And I guess I just forgot about the diarrhea. I thought I just ate something that didn't agree with me. And literally for two hours, I was going back and forth from the bathroom to my bed. Um, And then kind of like that cramping started, but I didn't put two and two together until it wouldn't go away. And then I was like, oh, I'm in labor. So that started around 3 a.m., but it took until 5 a.m. for me to recognize that I was in labor. And so I went downstairs um, around 5.30, 6 o'clock to watch television and just kind of breathe through the contractions or as I refer to them, surges. And my mom happened to be asleep on the couch as well. And she woke up around 7 and noticed that my breathing had significantly changed, um, that it was sounding more like relaxed and longer breaths. 
And she asked, are you having contractions? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and then she said, well, are you tying them? I said, no. And she's like, well, how long have you been having them? I was like, oh, since early this morning. So it was very casual. I wasn't in any pain necessarily, just you know, noticing that I needed to breathe through them. And so she suggested that we call the midwife and our doula, which we did around 8 a.m. And she, I guess, was in contact with them. I kind of was just focused on breathing through the surges and spoke to my doula. And she suggested that, you know, I take a shower, get something to eat because my mom noted that they were about every five to four minutes apart. And so we kind of just took it slow. And I remember it was an election. It was just a local election. And as we were getting in the car, my mom asked if I wanted to stop and vote, which I promptly said no, <laughs> very sternly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I don't need to do that. It's, it's not, no, <laughs> we're good. So <laughs> we continued on our way. I think we left the house around 1130. Well, at this time, my midwife and my doula were already at the hospital hospital, right? Because two hours had passed. I guess I took a really long shower and my mom didn't really push me along. And so we got to the hospital around noon and they were like, we were waiting for you. There are no rooms available. So here I am in active labor and there are no rooms available. (laughs) So it's so funny because my mom has to remind me that we waited for about an hour and a half. But because of the hypnobirthing techniques, it literally felt like 15, 20 minutes. I was totally in the zone. I was in the wheelchair, just doing my breathing and just totally went within. And so for the most part, the majority of the in-between and the moving locations is kind of hazy or blurry for me. But I do recall having a bout of nausea as soon as we got into the room. Um, So I was vomiting pretty substantially and they definitely didn't want me to get dehydrated. And so they went ahead and and started me on an IV. And I remember the contractions being predominantly in my back and my lower um, hips and sacral area. And I was not experiencing them like they described them with that kind of rubber band wrapping around your stomach and tightening. It was all in my back. So um, I was experiencing back labor. And I remember them trying to insert the IV was excruciating because I had to lay on my back. And it felt literally like someone was punching my spine with the pressure of the bed against my spine as well. And so it was very, very, very uncomfortable. So they finally got that done and I, it just, it was all very intense. And so I got on my hands and knees and time kind of just faded away at this point. Um, I remember just kind of being like a deer in headlights, like this position is the only thing that feels comfortable to me, the only thing that feels safe. So I'm just going to stay here. And like I said, there were no rooms when I got there. And so there were a lot of people in labor. And the anesthesiologist must have come into my room like three or four times to kind of go over like the waiver and the forms that you have to sign. Um, And I don't remember signing a thing. I do not remember signing a thing. I feel like she got called out of the room several times to um, administer an epidural or what, whatever. And I just remember every single time that door opened, there was like a rush of cool air that came in and I would start to shiver. And if you've ever been trying to focus on your breathing (laughs) while you're in the middle of a contraction or surge and your body kind of just involuntary starts shaking, it creates tension in your body, which is the opposite of what you want to achieve when you're trying to breathe through them. And I I remember getting fed up with the door opening so many times and just yelling like, shut, (laughs) shut the door. (laughs) And, you know, some choice expletives in in there. (laughs) I was just like, okay, I'm trying to focus and these people coming and going are really um, breaking my concentration. Yeah. So it was very frustrating <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but I remember being on my hands and knees for so long that literally my arms and legs were shaking and my doula and my mom had to beg me to like just change positions and let them just take my weight for a little while, which I did. <laughs> So again, being in the hands and knees is what really felt comfortable to me. And that's actually what I chose to to birth my son. So we got to the hospital at noon and he was born at 5.45 p.m. So about almost six hours of laboring in the hospital. I remember feeling that pressure and my water hadn't broken. So everything was intact. They hadn't opted to break it. Literally, it was just the IV fluids. That was the only medication 
it's not really medication, it's just saline solution um, that I was receiving for hydration. And then when I felt that kind of pressure to bear down a little bit, my midwife you know, said, okay, the bag is visible, right? As, as my son was crowning. And so she tore a little hole in it as he was coming out and audibly said, there's meconium, right? There's a little meconium there, but she didn't sound alarmed, but this was a teaching hospital that we were in. The nurse who I don't even remember, you know, rushed out of the room and started, I could hear her yelling in the hallway. And so all of a sudden, like here I am trying to focus on my body, my baby and, and breathing my baby down and the bed starts shaking. And I'm like, what is going on? Why is my bed shaking so vigorously? And I found out after the birth that they were trying to roll me to the operating room because of the little meconium that my midwife noticed. So at that point, the hospital staff took over and whatever their agreement was, she essentially kind of had to acquiesce to to whatever their protocols were, but nobody was explaining anything to me. And so the reason why the bed was shaking so vigorously is because my mom stuck her foot behind the wheel of the gurney so they couldn't move the bed. And she whispered into my ear rather sternly, push. And so I pushed and I felt that ring of fire because it was a forced pushing and he was born. Oh my gosh. Ultimate mom move right there. I know, right? Absolutely. And I thank her to this day. Like, um, I thank her for that because she advocated for me without including the staff. Like she knew what was about to happen Yeah, and she stopped it. And my son was literally on his way out and I was completely naked. They were prepared to roll me through the hallway completely naked without explaining to me what was happening. Wow. And so my mom was like, nope, not on my watch. Yeah. (laughs) And literally it was two pushes and he was born. Oh my gosh. And I did tear because it was that force pushing and I Mm -hmm. wasn't given the opportunity to allow my body to do what it needed. And my son was not ever in distress at all. Mm. So this was 14 years ago. (laughs) A lot has changed since then. Yeah. But 14 years ago, that was kind of their protocol was the little slight of meconium, the sight of it. They, you know, essentially intervened, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so my midwife actually came back and apologized profusely. She said, I shouldn't have said anything out loud. And um, she was very apologetic about it. Okay. So how was your postpartum experience with him? My postpartum with him was great. So because of the tearing, I kind of, it was a two degree tear. Um, So it wasn't huge, but for a first time mom, not knowing what to expect, the kind of relegated me to going up and down the stairs just once a day. So I kind of like either had to choose if I wanted to be upstairs (laughs) during, during the majority of the day or downstairs during the majority of the day. And so my mom actually created like a little apartment upstairs for me with a mini fridge and a microwave. (laughs) Um, So she was very, very sweet. And my parents were in love with their grandson, like despite the circumstances of him coming into this world, um, all of that kind of faded and, you know, they loved on him and um, loved on me during my postpartum period. So I felt very supported in my postpartum. His latch and breastfeeding initially were great. And it wasn't until like trying to initiate like the pumping and going back to work and being in school that difficulties arose, but he was a great latcher and I didn't have any issues with any postpartum depression or anything like that. It was all in all a relatively good postpartum. Okay. So then you had obviously a big stretch in between Mm -hmm. babies. So Mm -hmm. let's talk about planning for pregnancy when it came to your, your second. Yeah. So my daughter, Isla, Um, She was planned. We had two miscarriages prior to conceiving her. And I was married at the time to my wonderful husband, Diego. And this was his first experience with pregnancy and with childbirth. And there was a nine-year gap in between my oldest and my middle. And I was like, oh, I need to take the class again. (laughs) Like, has birth changed since I had him? So, you know, I was like, let me just, you know, I think I need to take the class again and he needed to take the class. And so we retook um, hypnobirthing the Mongan method class together. And it was a different experience this time, right? Because I was in a loving, supporting relationship, right? I call this kind of my healing birth because I got to re-experience it um, in a completely different context. 
And so for me, it was like I I was able to really appreciate and flourish in my pregnancy, right? Celebrating it um, as opposed to the shame that came with being, you know, an unwed mother. <laughs> so there was no shame this time around. And so I got to to celebrate that and learn with my husband and grow with my husband through through the process. And I feel like I was able to more perfect the hypnobirthing um, techniques this time around because it was not my first time with the techniques, but I was able to dive deeper with them. So I was excited about that. Yeah. And did you plan for like the same kind of birth, midwife? Yes. I knew I wanted a midwife again, but this time I was like, I don't want to be in the hospital. <laughs> I yeah. did not want to be in the hospital. <laughs> I actually wanted a home birth, mm. but my husband was like, mm, I'm not comfortable with that. And so I was like, well, let's meet halfway. And we met halfway by planning a birth center birth that was, you know, but he wanted to know like, how far is the hospital from the birth center? Like yeah. he's very like logical and mm -hmm. practical in his thinking. And so we agreed that we would do a birth center birth with certified nurse midwives. Okay. So anything else from that pregnancy that you want to share? I will definitely say that that pregnancy, I feel like your body remembers like muscle memory and subsequent pregnancies, I feel like your body springs into action way more quickly. So I was experiencing like round ligament pain and <laughs> all the different things you experience in your first pregnancy, but I was experiencing them much earlier than I had in my first pregnancy. I remember having a lot of pelvic discomfort. And so eventually I ended up getting introduced to chiropractic care, which in my third pregnancy, I started immediately. <laughs> so I did chiropractic care in my second and third trimester with my second. And I had wished that I had started it far earlier because it did provide some relief. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of that as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and hear about uh, how this birth went. Yeah. So um, with my daughter's birth, I think I was not necessarily in denial. The things that were happening in my body, I didn't attribute to like labor, mm -hmm. right? So I had been experiencing uterine surges a lot, but they weren't uncomfortable because my previous labor, I had back labor. So I didn't know what to anticipate with those typical sensations. And so my husband would literally look at my stomach and say, no, it's as hard as a ball. And I'm like, oh, that's just baby because I was all baby. And all of my pregnancies, I would always lose a lot of weight and then gain it back in the third trimester. So I was really all baby. I was like, no, it's just the baby. And he said, no, like you're having a surge. And I was like, I don't feel it. It doesn't feel like anything uncomfortable. Um, so I had been having these for like, a few weeks. And then I remember the day before I went into active labor, I lost my uterine seal. And I noticed that the uterine surges were happening a lot more frequently that day, but nothing uncomfortable. So my husband interpreted that when I called to let him know, or I think I texted him to let him know that, oh, you know, I lost my um, uterine seal. And he was like, okay, so are you going to come home first or do you need me to meet you? And I didn't realize that he thought I was in active labor already. And so <laughs> When I got home, he had like packed everything and everything was by the door waiting. And I said, I'm not in labor. And he'd also ordered like the entire Olive Garden menu. And it was so adorable. It was so sweet because this was his first experience. And this was my second. So I, I didn't even think to, you know, translate different things for him. And so he was like, oh, so we're not going right now? I said, no, I just, that just means that, you know, it may happen soon. And he goes, oh, okay. So we eat dinner and then we get ready to go to bed. And I noticed there are no pillows in our bed. And I said, what happened to all the pillows? He goes, oh, I packed them. And I was like, well, you know, they have pillows at the birth center. We don't have to bring our entire bed, right? <laughs> and so he was like, oh, okay. I just wanted to be prepared. <laughs> Boy scout mentality there. <laughs> right, exactly. He likes to be prepared. Oh, he's an over-preparer. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, ah, you know, fly by the seat of my pants, you yeah. know, whatever. <laughs> Go with the flow type of personality. And so it was just a normal evening, still kind of having surgery. So I just let my doula know, hey... You know, just want to let you know things are kind of happening. I don't know, maybe tomorrow, maybe sometime this weekend, um, just to kind of put her on alert. So we were all excited. I remember at work celebrating the fact that I saw my mucus plug in the toilet. Like I like said, hallelujah, <laughs> like because I was so ready to be done. I was so ready to be done. And her due date was February 4th um, and it was February 2nd. So I was like, ooh, you know, things are happening. And I went to bed and then around, oh, I'd say probably 4 a.m. 
on February the 3rd, I was no longer able to like sleep comfortably. I was noticing the pressure that was building. I was noticing the tightening. And so I hopped up and hopped in the shower and turned on my rainbow relaxation, which is a a tool that um, hypnobirthing the Mongan method provides to people who take the class. Um, And it's about 28 minutes long. And I remember listening to it twice in the shower, just letting the warmth of the water hit my body um, and just kind of relax me. And so I took about a 55 to an hour long shower. And then I remember getting out and um, transitioning to the birthing ball. My husband was up at this point because he's a workaholic (laughs) and he like can't sleep when he knows things could possibly be happening and he needs to spring into action. So he, he was kind of, you know, piddling in his office and just, I kind of let him know, you know, that today was probably the day. And uh, I went to downstairs to hydrate and to try and eat something um, just because I know nausea usually comes on as you enter kind of that active labor stage. And um, I think I could only make it through about half of a fruit and oat bar. And I was just like, you know what? Nope, I'm not hungry. So I just kind of did some hip circles and bounced on the birth ball. And around 6.30, so about an hour and a half, I I told my husband, you know, hey, I think we should probably call the midwife to to let her know. Um, We actually had our older son, Aiden, who was nine at the time, um, we had two more hours before he was scheduled to get on the school bus. So we actually touched base with the neighbors and they um, ensured that they would get him on the school bus. And then another neighbor down the street was going to pick him up and he was going to stay there um, until we got home. So that was all taken care of. But when I spoke to the midwife, she was like, well, are you having contractions now? I was like, yeah. <laughs> she was like, well, you're still able to talk through them. So they seem pretty tolerable. Maybe we give it another hour um, and then call us back. And I said, no worries. Um, So I continued to kind of do my birth ball thing. And then I started toning, which for me, like when I start toning, I know that things are kind of picking up in intensity. And for your listeners, toning is kind of like making like a low humming sound, like deep from the belly is what I usually call it. So toning, that's kind of like my signal for like, okay, things are getting intense. And so I knew that we weren't going to make it the full two hours. So um, my husband heard me and my son heard me and my husband was like, well, maybe we should call the the, the midwife. I was like, yeah, let's call the midwife. So at 7.30, he called to let them know that we were going to be making our way in within the next hour. Um, and I texted my, my doula to let her know that we were headed to the birth center. And um, we arrived there around 8.30 a.m. And they were all ready for us. And we were the only ones there. So this is a birth center that had four different rooms or three maybe. But in this instance, we were the only ones that were in labor. Um, And they did check me and I was five centimeters and 60% effaced. And so they gave me the option to break my water, but I declined just because I wanted to make sure that my body was doing the work and that I was in active labor and it wasn't the augmentation. So I declined it at that time. And I was still talking right between surges at this point, but the surges were really intense when they happened. So I had to like pause and focus on my breathing. And around 9 a.m., my doula came and she just hopped into action. And we all agreed right after getting checked and checking in that getting in the tub would be the first um, course of action. And the tub was amazing. I just remember thinking, why didn't I do this the first time? Um, it was just nice to like let my body free float and fully relax and allow the surge to do its job. And I think we were in the water for about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, I remember having the tub refilled because it wasn't like heated. So they had to drain it and then refill it with warm water. (laughs) So um, the in-between was a little rough waiting for the water to get refilled, but it was just very nice to be in there. And then I think my midwife around maybe the two hour mark wanted me to get out of the tub so she could check me again. The surges were coming so frequently. They were probably at least one and a half to two minutes apart because as I was getting out of the tub, Right, my doula and my husband are like trying to arrange for where I'm going to end up so the bed, make sure the bed was ready. So no one was like really around. My midwife was standing in the corner of the bathroom and she could see that I was about to have a surge. And literally she appeared like it felt like out of nowhere and became like a tree trunk and just took all of my weight. 
<laughs> as I'm getting out of the tub um, and just kind of rocked with me through that surge. And then we did make it to the bed and she was able to check me and I was about six to seven centimeters. And she suggested breaking my water at this time because she said that there was a little bit of bulge and I agreed. However, she had to do it twice because um, if people don't know, there are actually two layers to the amniotic sac. And so she thinks she only was able to puncture the first layer because literally no fluid came out. And later it was because we knew it was because she was so engaged. Her head was so engaged that it like created its own seal because when she was born, all of that fluid came out. <laughs> um, and so it didn't really do much in the way of like releasing the pressure, but it did cause the surges to increase and intensify and come closer and closer together. And so I was like, okay, I can't be on the bed anymore. I need to move into a different position. I was much more free with following like the cues of my body and and um, moving into whatever position felt best. And so at that point, I was on the birth ball and I needed constant counter pressure applied to my hips. So hip squeezes and sacral pressure, um, I think constantly. So it was just a lot of pressure. So I knew she was in my pelvis, like she was descending very quickly. And suddenly I just was like, okay, I want to lay down again. And the surges kind of plateaued a little bit, right? This is now becoming a childbirth educator. I realized this was like that period where your body is allowing you to rest right before, right? The big show, like right before your body springs into action. And so my doula told me I was snoring for 30 minutes. So 30 minute period of rest, (laughs) snoring, like completely relaxed. And then all of a sudden that pressure built really, really, really quickly. And I was like, oh no, it's time. I got to push. (laughs) I feel it. And so I got in my hands and knees and I remember toning, but I remember the toning turning into kind of like a primal grunt as I breathed my daughter down. Um, I attempted to control her descent because I did not want to tear again. I tore the first time and, and I knew following my body's lead as opposed to force pushing was the ideal outcome for trying to prevent tearing. And so I learned though that this child did not want to be controlled at all. (laughs) And she came out. I wasn't fully dilated to 10 centimeters yet. There, I was about a nine. And so my midwife actually kind of pushed the last little centimeter of cervix back manually, which wasn't necessary. I feel like my body would have allowed her to pass without that manipulation. But they did do some warm compresses. And let me just say that warm compresses are amazing during that time. Like it causes just those muscles to relax even more to accommodate baby. But I remember verbally saying audibly, like, this feels amazing. And then four to six contractions or surges, she was born, her head and her shoulders. um, And her midsection was not coming as easily, which kind of alerted my midwife. I think she was, you know, a little impatient, (laughs) a little impatient um, because only two to three additional surges and she emerged. Um, But in my midwife's mind, for some reason, the fact that she didn't come out right away um, caused her to be alarmed. I wasn't alarmed though, but she she emerged about um, at 12 p.m. on the dot and she was completely calm, completely peaceful. And the room was calm. We had like spa music playing in the background. And I just remember she just looked at us like her eyes were like wide open. And she was breathing and fine, but for some reason, they they wanted to hear her cry. I wasn't concerned about her crying. I know that hypnobirthing babies are typically very calm when they're born. And I think it took about 15 minutes for her to like actually audibly cry. But she was lo- looking around and she was completely alert. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think it's, we're so used to seeing babies crying in like portrayals of birth and right. movies and stuff that we expect it. But yeah, as long as they're breathing and their color looks good, it's absolutely they don't have to be a, they don't have to be mad. <laughs> no, they don't have to be mad until you make them mad with yeah. you know the vigorous rubbing or yeah. the <laughs> yeah. they're like, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. They're like, why are you touching me? <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds like a very different birth experience. Did you feel like that played into how your postpartum went at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. My postpartum with my daughter, 
because I had support from the very beginning, I was able to really focus on bonding with her and just being present with her. And my parents came up literally that night. We texted them to let, let, let them know we were in labor and they drove up from Richmond to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was where we were living at the time. And my mom stayed for about a week and kind of like did all of the meal prep and all of that. So I didn't have to worry about all of that. All I had to do was nurse, bond, and sleep. And I appreciated that. And they took care of my son to make sure he felt loved on. So it was a really, really great experience. I was able to take eight weeks off of work, which was really nice. And yeah, so it was it was a great... Oh, and she latched immediately. And my, my breastfeeding journey with her um, was significantly longer. And um, she self-weaned. I wasn't ready, but she, she was. But overall... Yeah, it was a great postpartum experience. All right. So now let's get to baby number three. Ooh, baby number three. So with baby number three, um, we had moved to Sarasota, Florida, and he was absolutely planned. In fact, I removed my IUD and literally the week after I removed my IUD, we were pregnant. So my midwife, I scheduled a, the, the first prenatal appointment with my, my midwife and she goes, well, didn't we just see you? like a month ago? I was like, yeah, you did. In fact, you removed my IUD. <laughs> so oh I was like, you got the magical touch, I guess. Because <laughs> literally, literally the week after it was removed, we were pregnant with my son. Whoa. This was a surprise gender birth. Like we, I did not want to know. I was like, I have a daughter. I have a son. There are so few good surprises in life. I wanted this to be a surprise. And my husband, who's the planner, like he found it difficult at first, but then he was like, okay, we're not going to know. Um, we're not going to know. So we chose not to know. Funny thing is though, I had a dream, I think two to three weeks before our son was born, that it was a boy and that we named him Ezra. And so I told my husband, he's like, okay, we had like a list of names and um, girl names for us were so much more easy to agree upon than the boy names. <laughs> so we didn't really have any names picked out that we agreed upon. We just kind of had a running list. And so with this pregnancy, we wanted to have a birth center birth and we planned for a birth center birth. There were several contributing factors to my care. Um, I was 34 at the time, which considered me to be a advanced maternal age or geriatric pregnancy, um, which I still don't like either of those terms. So that was like a risk factor. I had some other health issues that were kind of making me like on the edge of the practices risk barometer, like what they were willing to take in. So I kind of had to advocate for myself in various stages throughout my pregnancy with them just to ensure that like I could have the birth center birth. Um, so that was several trips to maternal fetal medicine um, just to make sure everything was good. And we got to 40 weeks and baby was not here. <laughs> <laughs> which is completely normal um, because gestation for everybody is different. Well, it's four weeks, right, that people can have their babies, anywhere from 38 to 42 and and, and some days. Um, however, in the systems that we operate in, they have a timeline, right? Legally, there was a time frame that I had to birth my baby in order to be able to have my baby at the birth center in Florida. And so that's kind of the clock that I was up against was this arbitrary legal parameter. And so I, I did everything that I could think of <laughs> to try and initiate labor, but he just was not ready. I even had two weeks of prodormal labor where it was like surges were happening for 30 minutes and then they would go away. I did the walking. I did the spinning babies techniques. I did rebozo. I did everything. And the one thing I did not do was the midwife's brew or castor oil. I just did not want to do that. <laughs> I did not want to be pooping. <laughs> I just did not. Um, that didn't appeal to me. Um, and so we got to 42 weeks and one day. And in between the 40 week mark and the 42 weeks in one day, there was a lot of non-stress tests that I had to do if I wanted to continue my care with that practice. And so every single time I went into the hospital to have the non-stress test, they were pushing induction and pushing induction, right? Like we can have this baby in your arms tonight. Why don't we just induce you? And my response every time was, is my baby okay? 
am I okay? Then I would rather not. (laughs) And so I had to do that three times, right? And the pressure that birthing people and women are put under in those circumstances is just unnecessary. And I remember questioning whether or not I wanted to birth in that hospital because we had a really negative experience with an ultrasound technician um, who had horrible bedside manner, just awful, should not be working with pregnant people at all. Didn't introduce himself, had an attitude, (laughs) um, essentially said that I didn't have enough amniotic fluid. And I said, well, I was literally just at my appointment today and everything checked out great. It just was not a good experience at all. And so that was like an emotional thing that was kind of hanging over. Like, where are we going to birth this baby if we can't have it at the birth center? So we were looking at alternative hospitals and our midwife, you know, said, if you risk out, like you do not have to induce. You can certainly wait until spontaneous labor starts on its own and then go back to the hospital. And at 42 weeks, I just was not mentally or emotionally or even physically prepared to continue. Like I just was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to go ahead and opt for the induction. And I use that choice of words of opting because it is a choice. And I feel like a lot of times people think that they have to do things. So it can be advised and it can be suggested, but ultimately the choice is yours. And so I opted to choose the induction because I was I was pretty much done at that point. But I went into the induction informed. Um, at this point, I had actually become a hypnobirthing childbirth educator. And so The care team knew that (laughs) and um, because of all of the um, seeds of, um, I call planting seeds, like I planted seeds of my expectations and what I was desiring for my birth. So they supported that and I didn't wear the clothes, like all of the subtle things that they do that is procedure, I kind of bucked it like, nope, not going to do that. I was dilated to about a four. So my body was already doing it. That's what the prodromal labor was doing, I assume. And so the doctor opted for just Pitocin, right? Like there's nothing else that we really need to do because your cervix is already doing what it needs to do. It's just the contractions, right, aren't sticking. (laughs) And so the reason why we think that is, is because I do have diastasis recti from the previous two pregnancies. So we think that baby just wasn't sitting directly on the cervix to keep those contractions going and that he was kind of falling forward a little bit. That's what my midwife suspects. And and I kind of agree with her um, in that summation. We started with Pitocin and I let them know that I was going to control, not literally, I wasn't pushing the button because I'm not a nurse, (laughs) but I told them I would let them know when and if I wanted to increase the amount of Pitocin. Typically, procedurally, they do it by two MUs every 30 minutes, particularly in the United States. That's how they utilize Pitocin for an induction. I told them um, that I would start at two, but I did it every hour as opposed to every 30 minutes just to allow for my body time to kind of adjust. And um, I didn't really feel anything. The The induction started on a Saturday at 2 p.m. And I did not feel the first like inkling of a contraction until like five. Like I was like, oh, okay, I, I kind of feel something. And with Pitocin, with you know, when you're being induced on Pitocin, they do have to do continual fetal monitoring. And I remember thinking, this baby does not want to be monitored. And sure enough, like the nurse was so focused on keeping baby on the monitor that I kind of just labored and just kind of did my thing while she was trying to find baby's heartbeat. I was never concerned. He kept moving. And so that was kind of the annoying thing was having the monitor like moved constantly. And then it was probably around 6 p.m. that they started becoming more frequent and stronger. And so I alerted my doula and my birth photographer that they could kind of casually make their way to the hospital because I just didn't know. I didn't know how long this would be um, because I'd never experienced induction before. And then things really picked up around 7, 7.30. And luckily my my doula came around um, 7 and we transitioned to the tub and I spent the majority of the rest of my labor in the bathtub. 
Um, so there was a lot of hip squeezes, a lot of water effleurage, right? So the pouring of water over my body and my belly just as a comfort measure. And um, my husband turned on the rainbow relaxation um, track again. And there is an image of an opening flower that the Hypnobirthing Institute provides. And because I'm an educator, I didn't actually need the physical picture. It's like cemented and burned in my brain. After every like sensation, every surge, every contraction, I envisioned my body being that flower and just opening with every surge. I remember feeling intense pressure and I knew. I actually reached down and I could feel the baby's head. And I was like, okay, here we go. (laughs) So I was like, I need to get out of the tub. I like, I need to get out of the tub. And the surges were so strong. The contractions were so strong. I remember yelling, turn the Pitocin off, turn it off. And so the nurse came and turned it off. She had checked me before I got in the tub and I was about six centimeters. And so I was in the tub from 7.30 until around 9 p.m. And so about an hour and a half, I had gone from six to complete. And so as I'm getting out of the tub, my doula and my husband and the nurse are helping me. And I just remember saying, I'm going to fall. I'm going to (laughs) fall. I'm going to fall. And here I have three people supporting my weight. And I kept thinking, I'm going to fall. And they were like, no, we got you. We have you. And then I remember getting to the bed and the nurse just kind of casually like peeking. And she's like, oh yeah, you're crowning. And so she's like paging the hospitalist. And the hospitalist apparently was probably involved with another birth. And so we got the resident um, who was amazing amazing. I had met him several times before during my like non-stress tests and things like that. So I was familiar with him and he actually did research and was like reporting to the doctor what hypnobirthing was. And so I felt very validated and supported. And what happened was that we got to the bed. I call it the natural expulsive reflex, but other people call it the fetal ejection reflex kicked in and it kicked in hard. I remember like feeling my baby move without me moving my baby. My body was doing it. And I was like, okay, I have to slow this baby down. (laughs) I have to slow this baby down. And so I just did my calm breathing, just breathing calm, slowly, slowly, slowly. And he was born within five minutes of me getting to the bed. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And it was not painful at all. It was just immense pressure, immense, immense, immense pressure. And he was nine pounds, five ounces. Mm, Big guy. (laughs) I've had one of those too. (laughs) Big and no tearing at all. Amazing. So tore twice in my previous births and he's my biggest baby by far. My son was seven pounds, 12 ounces. My daughter was eight pounds, four ounces. And this guy was nine pounds, five ounces. Wow. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it was a boy. And I was like, oh, I guess we have to call him Ezra. (laughs) It's amazing how different recovery is when you don't tear. Like it took until my third to experience that as well. And I was like, wait, it doesn't hurt when I pee? Like, what is this? (laughs) Absolutely. At the same time though, I was like, oh, I feel like a superwoman. And then it's like, my body was like, wait, wait, wait. Oh yeah. You just had a baby. Slow down. (laughs) Slow down. Okay. So speaking of that, how was postpartum with him? So postpartum with him was interesting because I had him February 29th. He was a leap day baby. So I had a leap day baby. I was thinking I was going to have him on March 1st because I was like, oh, it's an induction. It's going to take forever. No, from start to finish, it was seven hours. Oh my gosh. From first Pitocin to <laughs> baby, it was seven hours. And what happened was I'm hearing the nurses, even while we're there in the hospital, like in the recovery room, I'm hearing the nurses talk about COVID, right? So I'm hearing this chatter outside at the nurse's station, right? And they're like, oh, this hospital just had their first case. So there's all of this kind of in the air. And my mom had flown down to be with us shortly after we got home from the hospital. And it was literally the day after we got discharged, they shut down visitation. And so all of a sudden the nation is starting to like shut down. So my mom got here. She was here for about a week. And then after that, everything like schools closed. So we were doing school at home. So I kind of feel like I'm still in an essence kind of mourning my postpartum because I didn't get to have the experience that I wanted. All of my kids were home. My husband was home. Everybody was home with me and everybody needed something. And so it was a different experience. And I felt like I didn't have the full support that I 
would have liked to have. All of the things I had planned on doing kind of got thrown out the window because we were all staying at home. And so people did send meals, which was fantastic. And it was a blessing. My husband has amazing coworkers who did meal trains. My coworkers sent gifts and food. And so that I felt definitely supported in. But kind of being cooped up at home with all two of your other children while you're trying to nurse and heal um, was a little much, I think, (laughs) for me. Yeah, that's so hard, especially... I don't know if you guys are planning on having more babies or not, but I know for my third, I was like, I want to soak in every minute, you know, and all of that. And COVID would have thrown a huge wrench in that. Yeah. So we are, we are done. I would have loved to have more children because I know this is going to sound weird, but I genuinely love giving birth. The pregnancy part, I'm not as enthusiastic about, Yeah, but I genuinely love the experience of giving birth. I've always felt the most connected to my babies. Mm. I've also felt the most connected to myself, like my true self and the power that comes with birth. It's almost like an adrenaline high, Yeah, right? That high after accomplishing um, this amazing physical feat. And the reward of that golden hour, right? Where like, it's just the cloud nine floating in the sky. Like I love that whole experience and I would do it again and again. (laughs) And people look at me like, (laughs) I would do it again and again. For me, labor was not um, painful in the traditional sense. It was definitely hard work and um, it took a great deal of focus and concentration and effort, but it, it was not painful. Like I would give birth before getting a root canal. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're going to stay kind of in the birth world with the work you're doing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it was after the birth of my second, my daughter, that I was like, you know what? I really want to share the gift of what is possible yeah. in birth with other families. And so I went and got certified to become a hypnobirthing childbirth educator in the Mongan method. And I've been doing that um, since 2018. And I come from the HR world um, and I was teaching hypnobirthing and without fail, after every single group class I taught, I would always have someone come to me and ask if I could support them in their birth. Mm. And I could never say yes because I was working a full nine to five. And my passion is birth. Like I just, I love birth. And so I talked with my husband and actually I had, I was planning on leaving my job when I was pregnant with my son. And we kind of talked about my exit strategy and finding a different job. And then the pandemic happened. And so that kind of went out the window. And so we kind of wrote out the pandemic for the first year to see kind of what was going to happen. And then I was teaching a lot. I was teaching a lot. I think the pandemic caused a lot of people to revisit what they wanted from their birth experience. And a lot of people didn't want to be in the hospital given the environment and the circumstances. And so a lot of midwives got inundated, a lot of doulas got inundated, and a lot of childbirth educators got inundated. Um, And so I had been teaching nonstop. And I was like, you know what? I really want to do this full time. And so um, my husband and I kind of looked at our finances to see if this was something that his salary could support, not having um, that second income. And we decided that, yes, it was something that we, we could do. And so I left my HR job in July of 2020 and I have been doing birth work ever since, supporting families in their births. So I became a birth and bereavement doula and I am doing that and I love it and it's amazing. That's very cool. I love when your own experiences kind of spur that passion for something new. Definitely the same in my case, so. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, any other resources you want to share? Obviously hypnobirthing, but what else? Yeah, I think for me, Advocacy Mm -hmm. is really, really, really important. Having my mother advocate for me in my first birth kind of was that aha moment. Like things happen in the birth room that shouldn't. And we could just look at the numbers that our nation is experiencing with um, maternal mortality. Um, The rates are astronomical. We are the only industrialized nation that is going backwards, not forwards. (laughs) We, We are going backwards with with our, our numbers are essentially rising where everyone else is falling. And it's, it's a sad, sad indictment of our maternal um, healthcare system, particularly for women of color and particularly for black women 
and I identify as a black woman. And so um, that is something that I'm seeking to incorporate into my work. And I encourage others to get involved in advocacy. Um, The numbers are increasing for all women, but they're increasing at a much higher rate for black and indigenous women um, in this country and Hispanic women as well. And so it's just um, something that I feel like we should lend our our voices to, um, lend our um, support to. So there are a lot of people that I'm following and I encourage people to look locally at different organizations where they can get involved um, in advocacy and advocacy is necessary. So I currently follow Black Mamas Matter Alliance for Kira for Moms um, is a great organization, birthing advocacy and birth workers for human rights. Awesome. Yeah, those are all so great. And I love that sites like Instagram and the social media accounts these um, people have created can be so just informational and educational around advocacy. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah. So Instagram or Facebook. So Sarasota Hypnobirthing is where you can reach me at. You can just search for it in the bar and I'm the only one. (laughs) So there's not a whole lot of hypnobirthing educators in my particular area. Or you can go to Hypnobirthing Institute or hypnobirthing.com. There are lots of different hypnobirthing programs out there and it's not one size fits all. So find the program that works best for you. Um, Even if it's not hypnobirthing, I, I would leave with this thought that Um, If you are pregnant um, or planning on getting pregnant, um, that you should definitely do your research. Take a childbirth education class. Make sure that you are aware of your rights um, as a birthing person. Also, um, hire a doula. Um, invest not just into your pregnancy and your labor, but also your postpartum period. So there are doulas out there that strictly handle just postpartum. Yeah. So invest in one of those. (laughs) Invest in one of those. Yes. And yes, registries for baby things are great, but your experience ultimately is where you want to put most of your resources into. Yes, totally. And so many registries, like I know Babylist does it, you can put a fund on there to raise money for those types of things. Yeah. Give those relatives something to contribute to that's more helpful than a onesie they'll wear for like a week. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. It was so great to hear your stories. Thank you so much, Bren. Wonderful to talk to you. Now we're going to chat with Katie from KiwiCo, today's sponsor. Hi, Katie. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about KiwiCo. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Well, before we get into our chat about KiwiCo and the Panda Crate, can you tell us a little bit about you and what you do at KiwiCo? I am the Chief Marketing Officer at KiwiCo, and here we are just doing everything that we can to give the next generation creative confidence. All right. So let's go back and just hear a little bit about how KiwiCo got started. So KiwiCo was actually founded by our CEO, Sandra Olin. Um, She had recognized a desire for parents who wanted to bring very enriching activities to their children, but didn't necessarily have the time to come up with an idea or gather all the materials. So, you know, she came up with the concept, um, built it, and, you know, almost a decade later has conceived this incredible company that provides hands-on STEAM learning activities for all ages, from baby toddler all the way to what we generally like to say, like 104, but it's for all ages. Yes. My... I have three kiddos and my two older ones have been, you know, doing the KiwiCo membership for years now. So we're big fans and I was excited to learn about the Panda Crate, which is targeted more for the first two years of life, especially because my audience is mostly in that bracket. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into the Panda Crate line and how you guys developed it. Personally love the Panda line as well. I'm a new mom myself. Um, And Panda Crate is actually just based on a belief that babies are naturally very curious and creative. Um, And we partnered with the Seattle Children's Hospital. We came up with various ways to think about, you know, a child's healthy development stages and sought to help make that easier and better and enriching and fun. And so, you know, at least for myself as a new mom with a first baby, knowing that I had these crates that could be delivered to me, it just made so much of the development stages more fun and also easier just because a lot of times, I mean, I don't know about all the moms out there, but for us, it's just a massive adjustment with your first kid. Like all of a sudden your life goes from, you know, 
one thing to completely new, you know, adjustments, schedules, the feeding schedules, the learning stages, and knowing that you have something like a KiwiCo crate and a panda lion that can supplement those activities and develop those motor functions has actually been incredible for us. Yeah, I think that in those first couple of years, you're just kind of in survival mode in a lot of ways, like trying to do <laughs> the the basics of getting baby fed and keeping him or her clean and all of that. And so, you know, you should be, you know, interacting and doing these different activities, but that sometimes can be really hard to wrap your head around. And so I love that the Panda Crate stuff not only is adorable, you know, products, and some of them are more like toys and some of them are more like learning um, activities, but they all come with that really great information on how to use them and how to kind of take it one step further and use those activities, you know, out in the real world too. Yeah. And I mean, like, if you think about about for us, the most basic first um, piece that we used were the black and white cards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a new parent, you're learning what is happening at every stage of your baby. And so to just know that I could reach in the box and I found these adorable black and white cards that had like the panda on it, of course, and that we could play with him and help him discover and learn these shapes because they can't quite see color in that way yet. It just took some of the guessing out of it and just made it a lot of fun, actually. And so that actually has been almost a saving grace because you're right you're you're in survival mode i mean i barely feel time pass the same <laughs> as it used to let alone like wait what day is it like what am i doing right now oh okay i have you know this like crate and some experiences as well as some things that i can go and play with him and help nurture these motor functions and skills i'm going to go and do that right now yeah and it's funny how quickly babies become you know, interactive and looking for things to do. I, we talk about it a lot in our, in our Facebook group about like, well, they seem bored now. Like they just want to be entertained all the time and that sort of thing when you're used to them just sleeping on you all day. So having something, like you said, that just comes to your house and has instructions and um, everything's high quality and definitely could be used, you know, for siblings and kept for years. Yeah. And we actually just created um, a supplement, a supplementary parenting blog that has tips and we also launched a email newsletter to help parents feel supported during this time. And it's actually been really um, rewarding just hearing what people are saying. And we love hearing what parents have to say. And for me, I can relate to a lot of those topics. So it's actually been very rewarding, both professionally and personally going through it myself and also having that community and a lot of people going through similar challenges and um, are curious about, you know, solving the same um problems together. Uh, it's, it's just been a really great experience. All right. So yeah, on that note, are there any kind of favorite, you know, feedback you get from parents or things that you guys have taken note of and made changes in what you produce for the Panda Crate? I mean, so much of it is about listening to, um, the community and what people say, and then tailoring our products to better deliver against those needs. Um, the common thread that we always hear is, you know, it's really made from quality materials and we're really proud of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there is always something for every single developmental stage and development level of your child and your baby. So things we hear a lot are just a newborn and I love it, which is great because then it becomes an originating activity for both the parent and the baby. Um, and then we also hear from people who use, you know, our toddler lines that it's really been challenging to keep their attention, but having panda crates actually help them engage their child as well as, you know, we know that they're learning something and developing something and being able to do that together, like I said before, is actually pretty great. And we hear that a lot from parents. It's so great. And it's such a great thing to just convenience wise to just have come to your house and a great gift idea for grandparents. Yeah. My parents are actually the ones that send the KiwiCo crates to my kids. And I know they love hearing about, you know, the activities each month and things like that. So I think you can really pull in not just your family at home, but extended family into enjoying the crates. I know it's actually been really interesting um, joining KiwiCo and being a part of this journey and seeing all the different kids in my family even use and engage KiwiCo because, you know, you sometimes don't see it externally, but we spend thousands of hours of research, prototyping, developing, and we actually go through a pretty rigorous kid testing process too, to ensure every single crate, you know, meets the needs of not just what parents are looking for, but the kids actually think are fun. And so in a way, it's almost like you've got 
that quality bar and guarantee going into it. So when, you know, your grandparents or aunties or uncles, when they send it to you, you just kind of know, okay, this is great. I can give this to my child and they're going to enjoy it and they're going to learn something amazing from it. And we can probably build it together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Before spring break this year, I was like hiding them, trying to build up a stockpile (laughs) so that we would have stuff to do every day. Um, And then I always take advantage of any time you guys have a sale on the ones that you can, you know, buy as a one off and I get a bunch to give as birthday gifts. So um, I've never had anyone be sad to get a KiwiCo crate. So I'm so excited (laughs) to be able to to share it with my audience. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I really do hope everyone who is listening gets a chance to try Panda Crates because they're they're wonderful for baby toddler. Yes, definitely. And we'll have a link with the discount and everything in the show notes as well. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much again to Amelia for sharing her stories with us and to KiwiCo for sponsoring this episode. Remember, you can use the code BIRTHHOUR at KiwiCo.com to get 50% off your first crate. And if you want more information from today's episode, head over to TheBirthHour.com and search for Amelia's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to TheBirthHour.com and click Become a Member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.